sitting here in my car, relaxing after work, listening to some old music on my XM radio. You remember back buying albums, buying CDs, and I would always buy a CD for like one song, you know, you hear one song on the radio, you hear one song on MTV back when they played music on MTV, and I would always buy an album for that one song, and then I'm listening to it, and I always find something better, I always find something twice as good as that one song they released, and then... Sometimes, you know, later on down the road, they will, they will release that song. Sometimes they never release a really good song. And I'm always like wondering, like, why? Why don't they release that one song that I love? Maybe I'm the only one that loves it. I don't know. But I've always been that way. You know, I always search out new, unusual things, like music, movies. So I find some of the things I'm into. That's why I'm such a fan of some things I'm a fan of. Like uh, Todd Snyder, it's like no one's hardly heard of. Every time I meet people and I try to introduce them to his music, it's just one of those things. Only artists I've seen twice live, I'd see him again. He's amazing. He's a storyteller. He's funny. And he makes real simple music that I just love. And, you know, a lot of it kind of like makes me think of me a lot. So. And that's how I find things like Letter Cat, which is another show. It's a show that I just fell in love with. And anytime I talk to people about what they're watching or someone else talks to me about, you know, this show or that show, I always, like, try to talk about Letter Kenny and try to spread the word. It's like this little Canadian comedy show that's on Hulu now. And it's just... I don't know, it's hard to explain. It's really quick, it's really smart. They use a lot of words. I've always been a big fan of words, especially with comedy. I mean, my favorite stand-up comedian of all time is George Carlin. And if you know anything about George Carlin, you know that he loved words. And I just love people that can play with words and just make things funny by just talking normal, not, not setting up a joke, just talking and being funny. And all these characters in Letterkenny are like, I don't know, they're just unique, unusual, and they are not what you expect. There's guys that like work in the field all on a farm, but they freaking talk like almost like they're Shakespearean or something or just but then it's also absurd and there's stereotypes and it's just it's still funny though and it's not stereotypes not stereotypes that are like rude just stereotypes like like the hicks are one way and the skids which are like the freaking meth heads are another way and hockey players are a certain way but it's not like you know, they're very inclusive. Cast has a lot of, like, native people and... Which is, like, really cool because I'm part native, so then I always look for things like that. And that's how I found Reservation Dogs, which is another great show. And that, that, that cast is almost like, I think it's like 99% native cast and the crew included. I mean, they've had, they had guest people like Mark Marin is in an episode and some other people, but most of the cast is all native. And it's just kids living on a reservation, just trying to fucking live, survive as kids and, you know, 20, 20, whatever, in a freaking reservation. And I want to say it's in Oklahoma, somewhere in you know, the Midwest. And they are trying, the whole premise is uh, one of their friends committed suicide and his dream was to go 
California. So they all still decide they're going to make the California trip in his honor. And this, you know, shit happens that, you know, life happens. It's a really great show. People should check it out. I think it only went like three seasons, and that's uh, that's all there's going to be, which is kind of sad, but, you know, I like, oops, I like, they're following like the British model of TV. You know, British shows, they don't go for 15, 20 seasons. They go for like three or four, and that's it. And they go in with that in mind. Like, we're just going to do, say, three seasons, so then we're going to have a beginning, the middle, and the end. And that's it. And they follow through. And it's great. And I think sometimes it's better to have something like that than some series that go on and on and on. And after a while, lose traction. And after a while, usually nine times out of ten, well, maybe eight times out of ten, and poorly. You know, I mean, to this day, I've never seen an episode of Lost strictly for the fact and from what I hear, the ending was questionable to some people. Some of the fans liked it, some of the fans didn't like it. So I don't know if I want to invest time for an ending that I might not like. I mean, I may love it, but who knows? You know, it's just one of them things. It's like Game of Thrones. I've watched a single episode, didn't care for it, not my thing. So that's it, you know, like, I understand there's like so many people love it. I don't think I'll ever watch it. Maybe, I don't know. Like to think I got some time left in my life to watch things, but, you know, I don't need to watch everything. You know, sometimes that one thing that everybody thinks is great is like not my bag of tea. Is that the right thing, bag of tea? Sounds good. And a cup of tea. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, where was I? Oh, serious. Like, as much as I loved Heroes, man, that last season was rough. Ended poorly. But, you know, I still own them all on DVD or Blu-ray. You know, every once in a while, I'll watch them again. I'll tell you, that very first season was amazing. I remember watching it when it was on TV. You know? And, like... I fell in love with The Walking Dead from the very first episode, the very first scene. You know, I was like, when he shot that little girl zombie, as crazy as that is, I'm like, holy shit, they can shoot a kid? The first scene, the first episode, a kid. The show will do, you know, nothing whatever it wants. It'll push the envelope. And they got away with some, some crazy stuff in that show. I think they were one of the first shows to push the language barrier, having uh, some foul language laws was on at a certain time of night. I got away with more than that. I know that's not a, like a feather in your cap or something, but it kind of, I don't know, it's kind of cool. When you're dealing with a show like that, you shouldn't have, like, limitations. They never show much limitations with the violence. They never show that much limitations with the sex. So I might as well not show limitations with the language as well. Fuck it, do it. You know, and that's kind of cool. And I can remember I was there right in the beginning. The very, you know, it was, it was one of those shows that, like, I discovered right out, right from the bat, season one, episode one, saw promo, said I'm going to check it out, made sure I watched it, fell in love, stuck with it through all 15 seasons, I think it was, whatever it was, 14 seasons. You know, did it end great? I liked how it ended, because they did do really anything much special than any other episode, and I think that's kind of cool. A lot of times they try like try too hard in that final episode to make it like a big deal, and I think it's just cool to just have it end just like any other episode. Some people live, some people died, some of them important died. That usually happens, but that would happen at the, you know any given moment. You know, I mean, like, some of them were special, like, you know, uh, Glenn and that redheaded guy, 
They get killed by Negan right there. The first episode of the new season. Big explosion, you know, big way to win the season. But then when like Carl died, he like died like right now, like uh, just uh, every uh, any, just like, uh, every day episode, the middle of the season. It wasn't like a finale. It wasn't like the opening. I don't even think it was like a mid-season finale or anything. Just random episode. So you never know. Uh, I'm rambling. I think maybe I should go inside and give me something to eat. So today I'm going to talk about something I find funny. Queefs. I think queefs are really fun. It's interesting how women's vaginas can make these cute little farting sounds. I don't know why I find it so amusing, but it is. I think a lot of people find it funny. They don't really smell like anything either. I mean, you know, maybe unless the girl has some issues. But generally speaking... When it's happened during uh, sex with a female, uh, I just, I can't help but laugh. It just tickles my ribs, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. It's like a magical thing. Like, I I can't make a queef. I, I can only fart, and it usually stinks pretty bad. But these queefs are just these just cute little pixie things that ladies can do, and I just think they're wonderful. They're just beautiful things that nature has given to the female and I I just it's wonderful it, I I don't know what else to say about it other than the fact that you know ladies keep on queefing thank you Lance Ridgeland bringing you into the midnight hours with an old chestnut. Don't forget to wash the crack of your ass. Don't forget to wash the crack of your ass. Old Mabel loves saying shit like that. Don't forget to wash the crack of your ass. Every Sunday night in the bathtub, she would always say, 
don't forget to wash the crack of your ass. And I never forgot to wash the crack of my ass because old Mabel always told me to do it. She always, 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 always asked me to leave some change on the toilet every time I took a dump because it stunk in that toilet like you wouldn't believe. Oh, those good old days with the rubber ducky scrubbing my balls and the crack of my ass. Them was good old times. Them times was so good. It was like hog heaven. Hillbilly hog heaven. Cigarette in one hand, crack of my ass in the other. Oh, wow. What a good old time that was. That was a long, long time ago. Poor, poor old Mabel. Something done happened to Mabel. 93 Green disappeared. She disappeared in 93 Green some time back, and I never, never forgot what she told me, which was clean the crack of your ass. Never knew why, never understood why, but I follow that lesson to this day, and I'm an old, old cuss now. Still wash the crack of my ass every Sunday night when I take a bath. Yes, I do. And I thank the God for Mabel Wirtz. Because she done, she done taught me well. And I hope wherever she is among those astral poles, she is washing the crack of her ass too. By God. And that's enough about that. Dixie Red, this is one hell of a morning for those sexy-ass Angora-wearing bipeds. Who do we have on the parade light of today, Jay? So glad you asked, Red. We got all the bad Spanish wines, usual muckleheads. Bad Leroy Brown, that sexy little Asian beauty cat with the backpack. Those screwballs Nick and Fish. The white rabbit who continues to want to be called Eddie Rack. And everyone's favorite space group, Kenneth Kong. That's one heck of a lineup to be sure. And speaking of Bad Spanish Wine, this parade today is sponsored by Bad Spanish Wine, where every bar is like every other bar. Boy, you said it, Red. Those BSWs are all alike. Time was, I was a restless young fella. It took the bartender, Alice, out for a drink. We went to another town, Mule City, you might have heard of her. And we visited an alternate bad Spanish wine. And who do you think it was behind the bar? Not sure, Jay. Who? Who, who do you think? Alice. That was my first threesome. <laughs> well, ain't that a curious thing? You know, I've only ever been to one bad Spanish wine on Sycamore Island. That's a good one. Their toilets are nice and clean. Spit polished by God. Uh, ain't that the truth? This just in. Okay, today's MC is, yes, as you've expected, the little blonde boy. Okay, 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 okay. This just in. Because of new forecast, the parade is canceled. Apparently, the white rabbit saw his shadow, his five o'clock shadow, and can't run in the parade. Without the rabbit, there is no parade. Well, that's the typical rabbit turns. <laughs> typical rabbit and typical Angoras on parade. Goddamn parade never goes off the way it's supposed to. The deep rich smell of the bean juice coming from the Mr. Coffee Maker. Cheap day-old donuts. Chicken pot pie. Steam rising. Fellow Logos sitting at the table reminiscing.
tall tales told of the summer nights on Jolly Mountain. A fearless swain dancing in the moonlight. D and D and the secretive exchange of nudie pics for dollars on the page. Icy winter days on the flats of bootlace. Just cut it. El Corazon, the great, swaying and laughing in the cold, hard wind. The boys in cheery moods, giddy with delight. Toy Store. 
She had seen him staring at a little five-year-old boy bouncing on a rubber ball. The guy was licking his chops like a mangy old big bad wolf, looking to gobble up a little piggy. Bert had spent all day cruising the high schools for some little tramp to wave her ass in just the right way. They all had that wiggle that drove Bert back shit mad. But when he saw this leather-clad chick, not looking much older than most of his teenage victims, he felt that perhaps a little finger-fuck action was at hand. Looking down at his bloody stump, he continued laughing. This wasn't the kind of laugh that a kid gets when he sees a clown at a birthday party doing some stupid trick, or the kind of laugh someone gets when a neighbor sneaks a wet fart. No. This was the kind of laughing mental patients had forgotten asylum squeal out just before their shock treatments. The phantom finger syndrome was working overtime. Burke could actually see his severed fingers twitching in the bloody butcher block. He felt those same twitches on the nerves of his fleshy nub. The bitch had shot him up with some shit in a syringe and Burke wondered if that shit caused him to feel his fingers. I'm not much of a tut talker and I couldn't care less what your sign is. So let's get to it, shall we? She said, lifting the bloody meat cleaver, ready to remove the rest of his appendages. That's when the six o'clock news story flashed across Bert's mind. Crazed serial killer still at large. In big, pulsating red letters. The report tried not to be too graphic with the story or images, but like every sleazy tabloid news station, they showed explicit images of decapitated victims. Every appendage was removed, leaving only a naked torso. At that time, Bert thought of the old, truly tasteless jokes about the guy with no arms and legs that floats in the water. Bob! What do you call a guy with no arms and legs that sits in front of your house? Matt! What do you call a guy with no arms and legs that picks up a leather-clad chick at a kid's toy store? Bert! Bert screamed as the chick brought the meat cleaver down again and again and again. Meanwhile, across town, Wachowski, pathetic toady that he was, sat buck-ass nude with his sweaty butt crack sticking to his Brompton cocoa brown Italian leather sofa. It was 89 degrees in his apartment, and he was planning his nightly activities. His nutsack looked like a ball of dough, smelled of five days' worth of salt, whiskey, and dick cheese. The aroma comforted him somehow, made his mind sharp, focused. He began to strut through his apartment, waving his shit and crusted Ass masher 3,000 extra large dildo around like he fucking meant it. Tonight was going to be one hell of a night. Wachowski had discovered his latest star, Detective Farmer of the 51st Precinct down on Pico. Wachowski had been stalking Farmer for several months, watching his every move, taking in his scent at the local Sliders coffee place, grabbing snapshots of the detective doing various illegal and sundry things too and with the public he was assigned to protect. No wonder his mistress called this dirty cop her white whale. Tonight would be a true moment of glory when Wachowski spray-painted his vicious and insufferable seed all over Farmer's domain. His jizz would shake the heavens, kill the gods, and make the angels weep in torment. What a beautiful and lonely thought. Wachowski went to the fridge and grabbed some cold pizza. Licked the top of it and ripped a bite from its crust. Nothing like cold pizza on a warm summer's night. He meant this to be the bitch of the bunch. A night to remember. Dropping the cold pizza crust on the shag car carpet, Wachowski walked down the hallway snagging the Crisco can and his ass masher 3000. Entering his grungy bedroom, he let out a greasy pizza fart and saw the mannequin with Detective Farmer's face taped to it. The face was courtesy of the 51st Precinct website. Wachowski had pulled up the cop's profile with a picture and printed it on his HD digital printer. Amazing what just a few bucks on the black market could get you. 
just looking at that cop's face juiced him. Hi, Wachowski said seductively, bashfully, as he approached the mannequin slowly stinging a geisha gown off the hook on the closet door. When the cop mannequin didn't speak, Wachowski fluttered his eyelashes and giggled. The thin lips beneath his thick, full mustache widened in an obsessive grin. On his approach, he stumbled on the warped carpet, almost falling on his ugly mug. Wachowski hated this apartment, remembering with love his sleazy trailer that he once had. The neighbors forced him out of the trailer park after they found out about his strange proclivities. No worries now, though. The deep river flop house where he currently resided allowed all kinds of sickos. Wachowski was a boy scout next to the many freaks that stayed in this dump. His biggest complaint was that he had to share a communal bathroom and there was always some perv waiting around the corner or tucked back inside the shadow of some stall just waiting to fuck him. Wachowski thought about his first night in the deep river john. His mind reeled now, thinking about that encounter. It stiffened him as he approached the detective farmer mannequin. What happened on that first night was simple. Wachowski woke after midnight having to piss like a racehorse. Once inside the john, Herman, the whack job from 4B, snatched him around the throat and dragged him into the nearest stall where the creep proceeded to rape Wachowski with a pipe and his smelly prick. His ass hurt for a week after, but one good thing did come out of it all. Wachowski found a quick way to come. Never had he come so quick or forcefully before he had had a metal pipe shoved up his ass. Breaks down like this. Herman from 4B bent him over the smelly bowl and rammed a rusty pipe up Wachowski's poop chute. Wachowski's dick went rock hard. When Herman pulled the pipe out and rammed it back in, Wachowski jizzed all over the stall wall. It felt like gallons of cum just poured forth. He found dildos work too, hence the Ass Masher 3000. For the next few days, Wachowski had stayed in his room avoiding the communal john. He pissed and shit in mason jars that he stole from a shop on the corner. He was healed now, but the dildo and the Crisco remained a partner for life. Now, as he approached Detective Farmer's mannequin with the big black strap on, Wachowski grinned. What fun this would be. Of course, this was just the appetizer. The cop's real fleshy prick would be the entree that the mistress promised him sloppy seconds. Wachowski, in his heart of hearts, wanted to dig deep, find himself, and become a legend. He always aspired to be as notorious as the infamous Enema Bandit. That sick motherfucker forced enemas into his victims' poop shoots in order to make them clean so that they could be friends and ass rape them. Wachowski figured that it was a hell of a way of cleaning out the pipes. A little rough balling in the dirt never really killed anyone, had it? But he had bigger and better plans than that. He would be known throughout time and space as the Crisco Cowboy of Nine Circles Way. Hell, Wachowski even went through the trouble of buying a brand spanking new white cowboy hat. It went nicely with the jingle jangle of his shiny spurs. The infamous black phone on his kitchen counter sang to him. He, Wachowski, had to make a call. <phone rings> Meanwhile, the leather-clad bitch, Adawofa, was washing her pussy in the shower when she heard the phone ring. She finished finger-banging and licked them clean. The perv's blood from the kid's toy store was still etched into her fingernails. She even took a quick sniff of her digits to make sure her vaginal stink wasn't encrusted under her nails. She wiped the water off her tight, round ass cheeks, erect nipples, which were always standing proud, and fluffed her bush to make it bouncy and light. The fucking phone wouldn't quit. She walked over to it and picked it up. 
What the fuck do you want? The line was quiet for a moment, and then the voice on the other end let out a breathy sound. The tone could have meant murder or orgasm. Maybe both. It was hard to tell. When can we meet tonight, my mistress? I need... The voice said, Haven't I told you not to call here, you fucking dipshit? I'm going to squeeze your little nuts off of my heel, said Edda Wolfa. Please, please do that for me. I've been such a naughty little boy. I need mommy to touch it. You know the drill, fucker. Be here by 8 p.m. sharp. If you're a second late, no fucking deal. Yes, mistress. And Wachowski. Yeah, keep an eye out. Werewolf's on the prowl. Adewolf has said sounding genuinely concerned. That fucking werewolf's nothing to worry your pretty little clit about, mistress. Word around the campfire is some good old boys are gonna put a silver bull in that mangy fuck's headpan. Maybe. But it's a full moon tonight. A full blue moon moon. You know what that means. Werewolf isn't just his typical loathsome self. He's a cold-blooded killer. The phone went silent. And Wolfa sauntered over to the kitchen and opened the fridge. She took out a jar of what looked like preserves. She unscrewed the top, dipped her pinky in, and licked it off. I'm glad this didn't go bad. Would have been a waste of a perfectly good brain. Inside the jar was the pickled brain of a Nazi who was stupid enough to wander into Adewolf's town. No one wandered into her town without her permission. When she got the call from one of her douchebag loyalists telling her he saw a Gestapo goose stepping into town, Adewolf knew she needed to take care of her business. She did too starting with her usual s and approach, wearing a leather eye patch, carrying her custom cat and nine tails whip. Her bouncy and light beaver spoke volumes to all men, beautiful, flawless, with tight-toned everything out of Wolfa was every man's wet dream. The sawing of the cranium was something an old bow of hers, Surgeon Joe, taught the mistress when he found out about her abusive cop dad. Cop dad? was a total fucking pervert. He would fuck every orifice of little Adewolfa whether she screamed, cried, or prayed. It didn't matter. Cop Dad was going to get his rocks off all over his little one's face. When Adewolfa uncovered her old man's horrible scrapbook of the atrocities he had inflicted on so many while she was only ten, Cop Dad just grinned down at her with that knowing, sinister expression in those beady little eyes. The enema bandit strikes again. Guess you're old enough to know the truth about your old man, said Cop Dad, going to town all over her. Adewolfa couldn't walk for a week. When the school called to check while she had missed so many days, her Cop Dad simply said she had the flu and then beat her some more. Practice makes perfect, and she learned from the best. That old boyfriend of hers showed her what love was when he took her old man's brain, scooping it right from his skull while Dad was still alive. The boyfriend was a surgeon. Well, that was debatable since he never actually earned his medical degree. But he did watch a lot of medical television dramas. Surgeon Joe slipped up behind Cop Dad one night while Cop Dad was drinking his dinner in his police cruiser. Joe didn't fuck around with small talk. He just stuck Cop Dad with a syringe filled with a serum of his own design. The dirty asshole was out in less than a second. Adewolf was amazed that Joe didn't take more than ten minutes from the time he had had Cop Dad strapped down to the gurney until he had the brain in the pickling jar. She sucked his cock the whole time he operated. That was their shtick. Joe operated a lot. Until that fateful night, a dirty cop... Detective Farmer caught both of them in the back of Carl's roadhouse operating on a pedophile. Dirty cop, which is how Ada Wolfa always thought of Detective Farmer, was her white whale. 
She had tried killing him so many times over the years that she kind of started thinking that the grease ball was blessed. Actually fucking blessed. He had to be. Looking at the Nazi's pickled brain, and a wolf had placed it on her shelf next to Cop Dad's. The crude piece of tape with the words Cop Dad written on it with a big pen sat amongst dust bunnies. But you never forget your first. Had a wolf of thumb the scotch tape label smiling. Tonight, she had a date with that little freak Wachowski. He would be dressed like little Bo Peep and would want her to suck him. Wachowski got off on that kink. Joe, her ex, had the best cock. Wachowski's prick was nothing but a little nub, not more than a first digit on the thumb and size. That was okay. It was something to work with. Staring out her apartment window, she saw the flickering street lamp outside on the corner where chicks turned tricks. In the sky, a full blue moon. The kind of moon that shone only once in a, well, a blue moon. Was cast down over their dark town, meaning that the local werewolf would be on the prowl tonight. As much as she hated Wachowski, he was a regular trick and paid well. He was also a hell of a tracker. Adawolfa had used him more than once to hunt down certain sickos she wanted to put the kibosh to. She hoped that the werewolf wouldn't catch her trick tonight.